so dr many chow thank you so much for accepting the invitation and it's a privilege to have you here today in our studio thank you uh thanks for having me thank you for mk7 films for having me here today uh i hope by being here i can kind of dispel some myths about what surgeons are like <laughs> and uh, hopefully offer exactly. a bit of advice or whatever is needed to help the community yeah. thank you so much that means a lot to us and what do you want me to call you through the interview Keep many it easy. many yes. all yeah. right <laughs> So, uh, Manny, uh, let's start with the first question, which is the word surgery itself uh, makes people scared, you know. So, what is the reason for this fear uh, in your experience while you treat patients? Mm, I think surgery uh, is a fearful word for a lot of people because I think it's associated with the knife or a scalpel yeah. going into someone's skin. Um, you got to keep in mind that we only do a different aspect of treatment. So there's many different treatments for depending on the condition that people present with. And surgery, by in large, is just one of the treatment available there. So not every condition needs surgery, and certainly we don't take the decision to give someone a, a surgical option unless it's necessary. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's just one of part of medicine, really. So it's not scary. It's, it, I can understand it's scary for patients who are going through surgery, particularly those for the first time. Yep. But um, look, we try to make it as comfortable as possible. And I guess, you know, part of the reason why I'm here today is to help people understand more about surgery and dispel some rumours. Yeah. Exactly. So what type of sur surgeries you perform? Like how they are different from each other in terms of complexity? Yeah. So I'm a general surgeon. So general surgery involves uh, mainly abdominal surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I do uh, operations such as colonoscopy, which is involving having a look through the bowels with a telescope, oh, through okay. to minor skin surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, then we get to more serious conditions such as bowel cancer, which I also perform uh, mm -hmm. surgery for. So there's a whole range of uh, conditions that I provide treatment for. And at what stage surgeries becomes the only option? Yeah, so the, like any other condition that we have in medicine, there's always non-surgical management mm -hmm. and also surgical management. So usually surgery is, it depends on the patient and, and what they present with. So not always does surgery have to be the option. We, we don't take the decision to offer one, someone surgery lightly. So it is basically the last option? Not really the last option, one of the options. Uh, the options. Yeah, so most conditions I deal with always have a non-surgical management. Mm -hmm. We generally try to offer that first because why have surgery when you can treat it with medication or more simple methods? Yep. Um, and then surgery is often a different aim uh, of the treatment. So not always is it necessary. It depends on what patients present with. Yeah, so what I have noticed is there's a process by which they go. That's right, yeah. Yep. And everyone's I individual. So we don't usually offer surgery up front for most people. It depends on what you present with. And, and the age and all that. Age and, yeah, we try to tailor the treatment individually to each patient. Uh, Manny, what is the alternative to some people like me who start to shiver when they just hear about surgery? Yeah, I think the first thing is to meet the surgeon yeah. and basically um, develop a rapport with the surgeon, uh, understand, help him understand or her understand your problem mm -hmm. um, and then having a discussion as to what the aim of the treatment is. So I guess I deal with a lot of different conditions ranging from very mild you know, conditions such as skin cancer surgery or right through to bowel surgery uh, mm -hmm. for cancerous conditions. So uh, it just depends on what you present with. But I think the first step is to have that discussion and meet the surgeon that to you're being referred to. relationship. Yes, that's correct. And always when you come and see a surgeon, don't assume that surgery is the only way to treat. Often you'll be surprised. Most patients do walk away saying that, oh, I thought I needed surgery and I'm seeing a surgeon. But yes, although I offer surgery uh, in terms of the mainstay of my treatment, there's a lot of other options available depending on what people come with. Looking at you, I can tell you're the good surgeon. I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Manny, to what extent a person can rely on conservative treatment for the medical conditions? Yeah, so we like to say non-surgical and surgical. Mm -hmm. um, I think conservative means that we, we are radical as surgeons. <laughs> yeah. um, I think by and large, we, we try to make sure that people have gone down all the avenues uh, before we offer surgery a lot of the times. So once again, it, it's hard to have a blanket statement that mm -hmm. surgery is the best treatment for conditions. It depends really on what people present with. Yeah. Okay, and according to you, what people should be careful of after like a surgery in terms of 
better healing. Yep. So I think one is to uh, understand what type of surgery they're going for. Every condition and every surgery that we offer comes with a different recovery mm -hmm. and set of options. So I guess for some operations I do, such as hand surgery, although the hand is still bandaged up, we encourage patients to try and use their fingers as much as possible to prevent swelling. Yep. Uh, right through to if we do major bowel operations, then there's a period of rest needed. So I think the important thing is to have that discussion with your surgeon when you meet them for the first time and actually ask them, uh, what am I expected to do? How much time am I expected to have off work? Um, there's some things that will come with the surgery once it's been done that the surgeon will advise you upon, such as wound care management. Um, there's always a period of rest needed, but once again, it really comes down to what type of operation you're having and for what condition. True. Uh, many do the social attributes also affects one's recovery, like having a family or supportive friends? Oh, absolutely. So um, we generally often like to perform surgery on patients that are well equipped socially to help them. Um, whether that is in the first few days, you have some family help you with the cooking or the cleaning. Um, not always is it necessary for small procedures such as colonoscopy that I perform where we have a look inside someone's bowel with a telescope. Generally, it's someone to help them for 24 hours yeah. just as they get over the anaesthetic. Is it done through the mouth? Yeah, well, so that's gastroscopy where we oh, have okay. a look in the stomach, colonoscopy uh, through the bottom end. Oh, okay. Yep, but those those procedures are pretty common and they just need adult need supervision for, for 24 hours. Um, if you do something big like hernia surgery, then often for the first week we do uh, suggest that they do have some sort of social help to, to help people get on board. And what if like somebody don't have many family friends? Yeah, so sometimes we operate on patients, particularly the elderly, who don't have much support, then we do offer them to have an inpatient hospital stay for a mm -hmm. few days afterwards. We generally don't discharge patients home until we're happy with them physically and yep. also socially. That's great. Many, uh, what about the people who do not have family or friend support? Does isolation hinders them? Yeah, isolation absolutely does hinder certain people from having um, you know, a good recovery. Um, once again, we don't discharge patients home from any procedure, whether they're small or big, um, unless they're socially set up. Uh, most people, after having some sort of surgery, do need a period of where they need support. Sometimes it's as little as a few hours to 24 hours. Sometimes it's right through to a whole week or two weeks. So. It's very important that we understand as part of the initial interview with the surgeon mm -hmm. uh, what the social circumstances are. Not only does it kind of affect um, their recovery, but also the employment. A lot, yeah, a lot of these people are employed in jobs and it's important for them to let the employer know uh, from the outset how much time off work is needed because I guess they need to return to work at some point in time and they also need to be mindful that the whole world doesn't revolve about them. There are people at work uh, that will need to cover them we for certain people. Get... So we make sure that we outline that all as part of our first interview. That's great. Uh, Manny, in your experience, what is the percentage of full recovery after surgery? Yeah, so the, the percentage of full recovery after surgery, we always aim to operate with success. Um, I don't think any surgeon aims to operate with complications. Um, so we, when we offer surgery, we want to make sure that we want to get to 100%. Uh, success. I think um, that's the main aim. We wouldn't be offering any surgery if we don't think it's successful. Now, I guess things do happen, complications do happen, but overall, most patients do return to their normal, you know, state, uh, which a very significant figure. I think sometimes for you, it might be a dangerous place to be, where people think you're a god to them. And <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. We can only do so much. Um, certainly, even the most talented surgeons in the world um, do have complications. There's only so much that we can do with our hands. Um, we're not perfect people, we, but we try our best to. But you're not aggressive people. We're not aggressive people at all. I think a lot of people out there do think that surgeons are aggressive. You'll find that most of us are very nice. You know, yeah. while I was doing the research before you came, it was all about why surgeons are aggressive, why they are um, intolerant and why they are... I, I think that's, that's a fair point. I think there's a perception that surgeons are aggressive, um, but mostly we're confident people. Yeah. yeah. I think you wouldn't want to see a surgeon that when, not, when you first meet them, they don't know what they're doing or they come and give you an appearance that you're not confident in them. So... I think sometimes... But I think it's needed as well. Yeah, so I think sometimes the perception is surgeons are aggressive comes from the fact that we try to be confident. Yeah. Um, I think the job that I do involves offering people, you know, something when they're asleep, they have no control over. And so I need to be confident when I talk to people about what I'm going to do. Now, 
it comes down to the individual surgeon. Some surgeons may be able to convey that in a nice, gentle manner, and some surgeons, I guess, need to, to be yeah, they need to, uh, you know, talk in a way that's more aggressive. So it's a bit difficult to 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 actually kind of say that we're all. So uh, are aggressive. you like a both kind of? I think I try to be confident when I can, yeah. and certainly I do uh, turn back a lot of people from surgery when it's not needed. There's a lot of people that come and see me and say, I want this done, I want that done, and sometimes they surprise, they walk away from the consultation and I actually say, look, I don't think you're doing surgery is the right thing. Yeah. So they suggest you they need the surgery? Yeah, that, well, I get quite a few patients that actually say, look, I, I, need, I, need I, I, I would like this done, and then after you talk to them and interview them and examine them, you find, look, probably surgery is not in your best interest. And... I think in conveying that you need to be confident as well because you don't want them to see someone else and then suddenly find that they get operated on. Yeah. <laughs>
okay? Um, but once again, to maintain, make sure that you're as active as possible. Um, and unfortunately, in some instances, no matter how active you are, you may get osteoarthritis, which is wearing of the knee, where the bone becomes on the bone surface, and then some people need knee replacements and all that. That's not my field, but once again, it, it, it's making sure that you're overall physically healthy. And sometimes in life, you can't, no matter how healthy you are, you can't avoid developing certain conditions. And it can be hereditary as well? Correct, yeah. So you haven't done anything wrong, but yet you get it. That's right, and sometimes that's unfortunately bad luck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to the next question, which is sometimes, you know, kids get hurt and need surgeries. How parents should be handling kids post-surgeries uh, considering kids don't listen and they do not understand the sensitivity of the treatment. Yeah, so I, in my job as a general surgeon, I'm mainly an adult surgeon. I deal with a very limited number yes. of children. Okay. What we do find is, I guess, when we operate on children is when they're unwell, they are very, very kind of uh, tolerant of any kind of advice that the doctor gives or, you know, they generally, when they're unwell, they lie in bed and they listen to whatever parents do say. It's when they actually start to get better mm -hmm. uh, that they give an indication that they want to start playing around and not listening to things. I guess um, making sure that you talk to your surgeon and understanding what the expectations are for the recovery of your children from the outset is important. Um, a good indication when a child's getting better is when they start not to listen. So that's not always bad. So what would you say choosing between old age people and kids who are better to handle? Oh, I think... Uh, because old age people are kids as well. Sometimes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I, I'm a mainly an adult surgeon. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, surgeons who deal with children, our paediatric surgeons, have a very special skill set in that they um, not only know how to manage the child, but they also know how to manage the family. Yeah. And being a paediatric surgeon, uh, like some of my colleagues are, they're very skilled in that. They, they not only are able to kind of treat the condition for the child, make sure that the child's welfare is okay, but also they're, they're very good in advising the parents on what to expect. So that's a different skill set, which as an adult surgeon, I don't have. You're I, lucky. Well, well I've chosen <laughs> to become an adult surgeon because I don't have that skill set. <laughs> that's right. Many surgery is like highly skilled area of medical uh, practice. And there are so many risks involved, you know, with every surgery. However, sometimes things go wrong, which are avoidable. What would you say about it? Okay, I think um, to say that surgeons are highly skilled, yes, we are highly skilled, but so are other medical professions. Um, every specialty in medicine, uh, I guess, no matter who practices, does have a skill, and our skills are different. So I wouldn't say that my skill is highly skilled compared to other of my colleagues. I just do something different. You are right, sometimes complications occur and, you know, they may be avoidable uh, or unavoidable. We try to make sure they're unavoidable as much as possible, but bad things do happen when people go to sleep and surgeons operate on them. I think that comes down to the surgeon coming home at night and being honest with themselves as to if they had any other factors that led to um, that complication from hap happening. And also making sure that they keep an audit of their practice to make sure that this complication doesn't ha happen too often. Now, if they do find that something is happening a lot more often, then it's a matter of that surgeon reflecting and then going on to develop themselves personally so that they can go out and offer more safe surgery in the future. So audits are a very big thing in surgery. Yeah. So did this unpleasant thing happen to you? Or? I think any surgeon has complications. And once again, I would like to say that my complication rates for certain operations and procedures are consistent with my colleagues. And yeah, there are certain instances where if they're a little bit high, you've got to start thinking, okay, what have I done or what can I improve on? And then you go in and And it seek that. affects you mentally? It does. Uh, I think there are two people that are involved when something goes bad in surgery in terms of a complication. One is the patient and two is the surgeon. So I think, you know, some people think that we go home at night and we sleep well after a complication. Often these things do haunt us for a number of months and some people haunt them for the rest of their careers. Yeah, yeah. true. Moving on to our last question, which is a little bit away from the topic, but it's still about the healthcare. You know, Australia's healthcare system is one of the world's best, safe and affordable. Yet, why so much chaos and backlash on public hospitals, especially no guarantee access, uninsured quality, hospital admissions, and the entry is squeezed, and less hospital beds? What's your take on it? I think you, you are right. We're very lucky we live in Australia. The uh, public, you know, the Medicare system is something that we should be honoured to have. There are many other countries out there that don't offer such a great public hospital system like 
uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. But like every other system, I guess, that offers this type of service, the, the budget is not a bottomless bucket. There is only a certain amount of money that the government has every year to try and help the whole of Australia. Now, there is private health insurance to help with that, um, but not everyone They're can... They're very, very expensive. That's right, and not everyone can afford, can afford private health insurance. All I'd like to say is, I guess, patients who have an emergency condition are usually treated very promptly in the public system. There is nothing to fear up from there. Um, I guess the problem comes down to when you need elective surgery and you're on a waiting list because I mostly had a bad experience yeah. in emergency department at the hospital. Yeah, oh, I guess it depends on what the circumstances were. I mean, but yeah. by and large, I'd like to say that in the public system, we do get it right a lot more than we get it wrong. Yeah. Um, the government do have um, a lot of reporting indicators that they request hospitals to report on. One is the emergency waiting times, um, the time Too to long. surgery. Yeah, but I, I guess at the end of the day, Look, we, we are a system under strain and we try to do the best we can and most often we do get it right than we get it wrong. Yeah. So that's all with our first segment, Manny. And thank you so very much for providing us such a vital information. And that was just amazing. And I hope people who are listening to us and watching us, they will learn lots and lots about surgeons, their behaviors, and they'll scare a little bit less and listen to the surgeons. Thank you very much and thank you once again MK7 Films for having me. Moving ahead to our last segment which is Do You Know? Do you know using washing and using soap on your face and body can actually irritate your skin? Your ideal cleanser should be sulfate free. It helps to avoid stripping off the natural oils of your skin. So do not wash your body and face continuously and repeatedly. On that note, I'll take a leave for today and see you all in our next episode next week with a new guest. Till then, stay happy, healthy and safe. Rise above hate.